Hello, my name is Jocelyn Tan and I'm from Singapore and I play the sheng. And today for the AYE 2020, I'm here to talk to you about sheng performance technique so that any of you composers out there uh, will know what to look out for when writing for the sheng. So, first and foremost, um, what is the sheng? The sheng is a Chinese mouth organ that utilizes three reeds in order to create sound. So, what this actually means is that um, for my instrument, both blowing air through as well as drawing air through the instrument actually uh, sounds the same pitch. So, when, what you're seeing over here right now, this is the soprano sheng, or what we call the gao yin sheng, and this is a fully chromatic instrument. It utilizes keys. These keys can be pressed and they correspond to certain notes. Uh, and I blow into it by aid of a mouthpiece over here. So this is slightly different from the traditional show, which you can see over here. This is the traditional show, and this is slightly different. It is not chromatic, it is diatonic. And this one in particular is diatonic to the key of D. Instead of keys, it also uses finger holes. So, which you can cover, alright, uh, and instead of like a long mouthpiece, what I have is a shorter mouthpiece here, uh, yeah, and I blow into it, and the air goes into the wind's chest and out of the sheng at the top over here. So, today I'll be talking mostly about my soprano sheng, and this fellow over here, the traditional sheng, will only appear at certain moments to illustrate certain techniques. Before you start writing for the sheng, it's important to actually know how it makes it sound. In a nutshell, each bamboo pipe has a section on one end on which a copper reed or huang pian is affixed. So a red substance, which I was always told is a compound consisting of mercury, is dotted on the tongue or huang she of the copper reed, which is a flat created by making an incision on the reed. So each bamboo pipe is then inserted into a metal wind chest and the musician blows into this wind chest, or in the case of like my soprano show over here, with a mouthpiece. So all of this is pretty cool. However, ideally, each of the reeds of the sheng should behave with consistent sensitivity. So sounding with the same volume regardless of the, you know, sounding with the same volume when air passes through them regardless of direction. So, but this is ideally. So realistically, it's not always the case. And each individual shell, they are like kind of like different human beings. They each have their own idiosyncrasies. So one of the more, more common problems that uh, shell musicians complain about are the fact that um, different notes can become stuck. So what this is all about is that um, essentially our reeds, uh, our instrument, uh, the higher you go, the more, the greater the tendency for notes to become stuck. Uh, sometimes notes get stuck after a prolonged period of playing, um, which makes playing softly quite an issue as we need to play loudly, like one time or two times, in order to get the note, in order to get the note to become unstuck. So another problem is that certain notes of the sheng might sound noticeably louder or softer than others, uh, even when they are played with the same air pressure. So all this is actually dependent on the copper reed that is used for each and every single uh, read, each and every single note of the show, uh, and its consistency in comparison with the rest of the reads of the same show. So good musicians, they know how to compensate for all this for such problems. So like for example, if I know that my show, maybe the middle range, the middle octave, the B has a tendency to sound much louder than the others, I will know that if I'm approaching a note, I will play with um, lesser air pressure in order for it to sound more congruent with its neighbouring tones. Yeah, but all that being said, sometimes things do take you by surprise while playing. So what does that mean to a composer uh, looking to write for the show? I think it really helps to be sympathetic to the fact that some techniques, while theoretically they might sound possible for the show, um, but they may not be able to be executed at varying, uh, varying moments, varying occasions. Um, so 
Some compensatory techniques might require a moment's uh, preparation, such as, for example, blowing in advance. If I know my note is going to be stuck, I want to make sure that I've got time to sort of like blow it in advance. So these are things that players won't share with composers, um, but it might actually make your work like harder than you imagine it to be. So it might be good to have constant communication between both parties. Yeah, so as to manage expectations. So with this in mind, let's now move on and talk about some existing performance techniques. The first one we have over here for today, the Ta In. So in Western terminology, this is what we call the Grace Note or Achakatura. And it sounds like this. So according to European Western music traditions, the Achakatura is something, uh, it's a, like a small note that uh, one or two notes that are played on the beat or slightly before a main note and it's not supposed to have a particular like time duration for that particular note so this is separate from the appoggiatura so in traditional repertoire the ta in for the sheng might not be actually notated uh, performers are expected to know which notes to be uh, which notes are to be embellished and they will do so accordingly so the notes used in such instances would be those that lie within the typical harmonic framework and are easy for the performer to reach in terms of fingering so there's a bit of flexibility in terms of which notes to choose there mm, in modern day chinese orchestral repertoire it is not uncommon to see the achakatura and apogiatura used interchangeably in scores uh, that actually use Western uh, notation. So, uh, however, these are all universally actualized by show musicians as grace notes. Um, this practice is actually a byproduct of traditional cipher notation convention, which are your number scores. So, usually in number scores, uh, such notes are indicated as a number in a smaller font attached to a main note by virtue of an underscore and an arrow-like stroke. And there is no slash that is made through across the note in such scoring. Thus, uh, it's advisable for modern day composers, if you want to use an upper, you want to use an upper jetera, just notate out the whole thing in full, so, so as to avoid any sort of uh, misunderstanding with regards to that. Next, we're going to be talking about the chan zhi, or what you might call the trill, or tremolo. So uh, it sounds like this. So standard notation for the chan zhi is the same as in western trill. Uh, like for the western trill, you use a tr on top of the note. Yeah. So according to European music tradition, the trill actually involves the quick alternation between two or two sets of notes. Uh, to create a sort of flattering sound. However, as you can see, my show over here, I keep it upright uh, by virtue of my hands. Okay, I use this to support my instrument. So, when we are executing a trill, you want to be careful so as to avoid any sort of precarious situation. So, um, it is more common for show players, instead of playing, um, like, alternating when they're playing a trill, like, Uh, it is more common for us to actually hold on to one note and just quickly press on the other, like this. So, um, that actually creates something more along the lines of a trill and tremolo hybrid. Um, it's worth noting at this point that in Western parlance, there are different um, definitions for tremolo. So this is just one of those that I'm talking about. So I would think that chan is a bit more like in between trill and tremolo. All right, next. So what we have next is the hua yin, which is going to be demonstrated on the traditional sheng. Um, and we can actually liken this to the Western glissando. And it's achieved by gradually opening or closing a finger hole of the traditional sheng. And this usually applies to the notes uh, of the traditional sheng in particular. Generally, the higher register along the outer row of the instrument sounds like this. Yep. 
Yeah. So it's usually played in passing within a melody. Uh, but I've noted I've noticed that the Huang can actually be played alternatively in a slow and deliberate manner. However, it is hard to kind of aspire to any approximate pitch while executing this technique because the finger holes are actually very small. So it's not like I can say, mm, I want a half, like a quarter tone over here. It's quite difficult to determine that. Yeah. All right. So now next, what we have is the vibrato. So as most of you know, like in European music tradition, the vibrato is used as a tool of expression uh, and involves the periodic variation of pitch or frequency uh, of a note. So realistically though, amplitude or volume is often affected uh, simultaneously. So for most instruments out there, most wind instruments also, um, vibrato actually causes a change in pitch as well as volume to, to a certain extent. But on the sheng, our vibrato is actually, um, as is the case with many woodwind instruments, produced by changes in air pressure. But for us, because our reeds actually um, vibrate at a fixed set of frequencies, um, there's no pitch bend in our case. So our vibrato actually results in more like a, like a volume kind of change. And I'll demonstrate it right now. Sounds like this. So as you can hear, it's more of a volume change. Although, one could easily argue that there is a correlation between volume and frequencies. Um, and that a change in frequencies actually does occur when dynamic contrasts are made. But that's a separate issue altogether. So, but for the most part, we can just assume that, yeah, uh, it is more of a change, a vibration in terms, yeah, like sort of like a change in volume rather than pitch. So, um, while the vibrato is not usually notated, a wavy line can be used to approximately indicate the contour of a vibrato if wished. Okay, so next, what we have over here is the act of using the palm on your resonator tube. So this is a soprano sheng specific uh, technique and it involves me using my palm covering the resonator tubes. Um, oh, by the way, so these resonator tubes, what they are for is to actually amplify the volume of the sheng. So, uh, however, if you were to do put, do an action like this, it does sound a bit like the wah-wah effects panel of a guitar. Um, I'm going to play it for you right now. So, um, as you can see, I tried using the actual fleshy part of my palm and then I also tried using the, you know, more of the fingers. It's much easier to use uh, your fingers because it's easier to do this rather than to try to do this. Uh, but I think it does have a slightly different effect. Mm. So... A combination of a hand symbol with wavy lines may be used to actually indicate this technique. Uh, but this is by no means the definitive standard of notation. And there are actually quite a few there are quite few references from which a sheng player could draw inspiration from in this regard. So care should definitely be taken by the composer to clarify interpretation when they want to use such a technique. Um, it is also worth noting that preparation time is needed for the musician to actually visually check their hand positioning so as to execute this technique. So also, you know, if I have one hand um, occupied with trying to execute this technique, then I cannot use that hand to be playing notes on this side of the instrument. So and vice versa, if I were to use my right hand to actually cover any of these tubes, then you will have to uh, you will have to uh, note that any notes that are supposed to be played within this range by the right hand uh, cannot be played. Yeah, and there are balancing issues to take note of as well. So next, what we have is the hua she, or uh, what we would translate as flower tongue. So this actually refers to the flutter tongue. And I'm going to demonstrate it for you right now. So, uh, 
common technique produced by the rolling of the player's tongue. Uh, the standard way of notating platter tongue for sheng would involve the use of a symbol similar to an asterisk. So composers should note that the standard Western convention of using three stroke slashes on the note stems involved is not accepted by sheng players as an indicator of the technique. So we usually view that as an indicator of hu she, which is another technique that we will explore later. So in literature, Hua she can be further subdivided into two generic variants, uh, one being Bao Hua she, or explosive flutter tonguing, and Si Hua she, which is thin flutter tonguing. So as their name suggests, these variants are meant to indicate the strength uh, with which flutter tonguing can be executed on the sheng. But in reality though, it's almost unheard of for a composer, especially in an orchestra setting, to specify what kind of Hua she they want. Um, because Understanding of these various uh, variants are quite it's quite conceptual, and sheng players already they do adjust accordingly based on context, uh, and it's all uh, based on the relative sensitivity of a particular note's read. Okay, and next we have the hu she, which um in Western terminology we call it the tremolo, and it sounds like this. As previously mentioned, the hu she uh, is indicated with three stroke slashes on the note stems involved. And uh, parallels can actually be drawn between the hu she and the particular type of tremolo that involves the rapid reiteration or roll of a note. Um, the hu she involves actually the rapid alternation in airflow direction. So um, what I'm actually doing is that I'm using the tongue and the jaw to sort of push air out and draw air back in like so I'm doing that very quickly and this is a technique that's normally used in softer passages um, and it's quite frankly unsustainable at louder dynamic levels uh, having mentioned the hu she, I should now mention the sui tu and what that actually means is fragmented tonguing in Chinese um, there isn't a approximate Western terminology equivalent, so but how I would describe this is as rapid and irregular double tonguing, and it's actually intuitively used by musicians to replace the husha when trying to do the husha proves quite difficult uh, and unrealistic. This could be when passages employing husha has to be played too loudly. Uh, or sustain for too long or in, like what I said earlier, you know, if you're using my notes and my notes are always stuck, my higher register notes and they are always stuck, right? Um, they, you know, Husha is not realistic. It can't, it can't really work very well. What the Sui Tu does actually is to sort of mimic the effect of Husha uh, so that it should ideally be undistinguishable to most listeners. So I'm going to demonstrate just now those higher register notes using Sui Tu. So if I were to use Hu She instead, it's a bit different, yeah, but once again, it sort of depends on your intention really. If you want something, most people where they want to write for Hu She, they want to write Hu She, they usually want something that is like more fragile and what, almost shimmering like, you know. Um, so if you're prioritizing that evenness in sound, uh, whatever gets you there, you will use that. So if Sui Tu works better for that, instead of Hu she, a performer will use Sui Tu. So um, there is no known notation for Sui Tu because it's almost never specifically requested from by composers, um, given its unpredictability and lack of refinement as a technique in itself, because it is, after all, irregular, irregular, unmeasured. So now, uh, moving on to new techniques that I have discovered during the process of working with composers uh, during AYE 2020. So, the first being ghost notes. This is something 
executed on the traditional sheng. So that's quite funny uh, as a technique because it actually refers to the production of kind of like soft, unwanted notes of indefinite pitch. Um, and it's made by blowing to the mouthpiece of my instrument without any sort of, uh, without pressing any of the notes in particular. So um, normally in a good sheng, a good functioning sheng, what you want to do is, um, what you want to hear when you're not pressing anything and you're blowing to the mouthpiece, it's nothing. You just want to hear nothing. You want to hear nothing. Um, so we consider, uh, if you hear something, we consider it a defect, a problem, and that you should go and send it for servicing. So, um, however, sometimes this happens, and the exact pitch of these ghost notes cannot be predetermined. So as you can see, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So um, it is unreliable as a technique. But the sounds, if you manage to produce them, are quite ethereal. Uh, they do add a different dimension to playing, but they're very soft, so they might need a bit of amplification. Next thing, we have the finger vibrato, which is another technique that is uh, relevant to the traditional sheng. Uh, and this actually refers to the partial covering of um, finger holds in the traditional sheng, and then sort of like applying alternate pressure to sort of create a variation in pitch. pitch. So let me try to demonstrate. Given the angle from which the finger holes are uh, approached and the fact that they are rather small, these finger holes, um, not all notes allow for finger vibrato to be made, uh, to be performed. So as is the case with the common resonators of the soprano show, it's worth noting that preparation time is needed if someone were to execute a finger vibrato. But yeah, quite a cute uh, technique. What we have next is playing this engaged from the mouthpiece and how this actually sounds. Let me just demonstrate it. This actually refers to the player playing the shang by blowing into the mouthpiece but from a short distance away. So this results in a weakened production of regular sound from the shang. But what you get in exchange is a lot of air uh, sound, a lot of air noise, a bit percussive, but that's quite, um, that's quite cool. So in order to produce a sound from the shung itself by using this technique, a small focus and brochure is needed. So as you can see over here, doing something like who is good, but if you were to do something like ho, ho, or ha, it doesn't produce that same focus air channel, so it doesn't quite work. Um, also, trying to draw air through the instrument, like, it doesn't, it doesn't work using this technique. So, next, we have the whole idea of playing and singing simultaneously, um, which is akin to like playing multiphonics. Um, and this actually refers to the player um, voicing, using their throat, uh, some sounds, uh, while playing regularly. And it's quite fun on the sheng because uh, it's you know different from other woodwind instruments. The sheng itself is an instrument that can play uh, two or more notes simultaneously, which means that I could, if I wanted to, play a chord on my sheng and sing with my throat a different note. Also, the sheng does not require a specific embouchure to be played. So what you need to... So the embouchure that's actually used on the sheng, it's more of like, as long as your lips cover the mouthpiece, no air is like leaking through. Um, that's good. This makes trying to sing on top of playing, it's a bit, I would say, might be easier. So let me just demonstrate. Okay, so last but not least, we have the idea of prepared sheng. Similar to the way that the piano can be prepared, uh, people have used paper and strings on the piano, paper clips, all sorts of things. In that same uh, vein, the shun can be prepared. 
Um, and most people usually do that by placing things over the resonator tubes for the soprano show. Anything might work. Who knows? Maybe tissue paper. But yeah. Okay, so we've come to the end of my video presentation about shunt performance techniques. So thank you for your time. My name is Jocelyn and I'll see you soon. Thank you.